Hello and welcome. You are listening to the Investor Lab from lockdown once again. My name's Goose. My name is Gabby. And what are we talking about today, Gabby? We dive deep into capital gains tax. From the angle of it's not something that people should be afraid of because as we dive into in the episode, it seems to be a concept that people tend to have a lot of fear around because they want to ultimately avoid tax, right? Everyone has this thing about tax is the devil and I want to pay none of it. But we talk about how it's kind of just the cost of doing business, particularly in real estate, that if you sell a property, you're going to have to pay tax. But we dive into basically how you can think about it strategically and more of what you're doing and how in most situations, the benefit of the strategies that you're doing actually outweigh the cost of the tax. 100%. So my hope is that this is going to change the way you think about buying, selling and holding properties and realize that you're on a good track there. So let's get into it because there's a lot of gold in this episode. And I think there's going to be a lot of meaningful takeaways. We go, we kind of approach it from a philosophical angle. We also really dig deep into numbers and start talking about a lot of numbers. So I hope you enjoy it. And I'd love some feedback on this episode. Uh, if you enjoyed it, if you didn't enjoy it, if it was confusing, you know, whatever, like let us know so that we can serve you better. But without any further ado, let's get stuck into it. All right, guys, see you on the inside. Welcome back to the Investor Lab. You're with your pals, Goose and Gabby. Hi, hey, Gabby. Hello, Goose. Goose. How are you? You should be used to saying your name. Goose. <laughs> Goose. Everyone together. Goose. Nice. Okay, that's an interesting way to start the episode. So, um, Lock, lockdown week two, guys. Lockdown week yeah, two. Yeah, in case you can't tell by the audio, is uh, we are currently still in lockdown. So we're going a little bit cabin fevery, which is all good. But today we're going to be talking to you about something that is, I think, I actually want to kill a sacred cow with this episode. Oh. I've, I've got a bit of a bee in my bonnet because. There's a lot of misunderstanding out there in the, I would just say generally in the world, but in the real estate sector, there's a lot of misunderstanding specifically around capital gains tax. And now I want to preface this episode by saying we are not accountants. We are, you know what, actually, Gabby, there's been a, there's been a real issue lately with Finfluencers and ASIC has oh, actually really? started. Yeah, ASIC have started to really lockdown on on finfluencers people oh. that are giving fi- financial advice on tiktok now yeah. i'm not sure i'm not sure but they you know but i'm not sure if we classify as as a fin- i'm not sure if we're cool enough to be oh, influencers maybe maybe or well, maybe, maybe maybe not i don't know it, guys if we're influencing you let us know i'm not sure if we're finfluencers what do you think gabby we're going to do more instagram stories to be influencers i think so i think so in Thank any you. case the information you receive on this podcast is general in nature, and you should always go and speak to a, a licensed financial practitioner. Mm-hmm. We're going to be talking about tax today, so I really specifically wanted to get that in because we're going to be talking about tax issues and we're not licensed accountants, right? Yeah. Can I just add to that? So I think like it is really important because we want to be here to be able to like educate people and explain these paradigms, and sometimes we use specific numbers to be able to educate people and explain like the concepts. And it's really, it's a really fine line, right? Because it's very easy for you guys to take and be like, oh, these guys said we could do this. Take everything that we're saying and apply it to your specific situation as an educational piece, not as us saying, like, you should act in this way because it's not our, it's not our role. We're not, we're not financial advisors. We can't talk to you about what you should do with your tax situation, but we're here to provide this value in a way that hopefully makes sense. End disclaimer. Yes, 100%. But I think one of the biggest issues is there seems to be this belief, and I've heard this belief uttered a number of times by a number of people, and that is that you should never sell a property because you lose, basically because you lose half your money in capital gains tax. The selling costs are too high. You'll never make your money back, and it's just a really stupid way of doing it. And whilst I agree that if you hold a property forever, you will get a better return because it goes beyond exponential over time mm-hmm. in terms of the, the compound effect actually goes beyond exponential. And I do agree that if you hold a property for the long term, you will get a maximum return out of it. However, for some people, that's not necessarily practical. And in fact, for some people, selling a property strategically can actually be a massive win for their portfolio. And in fact, 
getting comfortable with the idea of selling properties should be something that every intelligent investor should do. And I, I believe that by being able to be pragmatic and assess your portfolio and assess market timings and to be able to you know, really think about what is going to move you forward rather than sitting in a place of dogmatic fear that you better not sell, you better not sell because you're going to lose all your money. I think it's going to make you a much better investor and you're going to get to where you want to go a lot faster, particularly when we think about things like market cycles, you know, like in a very practical sense, you could buy a property at the start of a market upturn, which is obviously what we do is we target those emerging markets. And if that market then grows for five years and then it flatlines for the next 10, is it actually still smart to hold it for the next 10 or are you exposing yourself to a whole bunch of opportunity cost? And so this is kind of the the premise that I wanted to approach this this episode with because I think that there are a lot of investors leaving a lot of money on the table and adding years, maybe even decades to their financial independence goals. And uh, and that's something that I want to absolutely want to smash today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think there's like it's a huge mindset piece with this as well, right? I always I you know me, I always jump to the mindset piece, but like just the concept of tax, like most people hear the word tax and they just want to avoid it at all costs. And tax is the devil and I want to not pay any tax forever mm. and that would be nice. And I think as you become more, I don't want to say serious about your investing, but if you, if you, it's an active strategy for you when you're thinking about like, I'm going to grow my portfolio now, you do start need to start considering these kind of aspects of the tax implications for what you are doing because it is a real reality of what's happening and the space that you're playing in. So, and I think it is just that mindset of we've all grown up trying to want to avoid paying tax and want to pay the least amount of tax. But as your income increases as an individual or an entity of whatever you are, you need to pay more tax. That's the current system that we're in Australia and that's how it's currently set up. So you need to get real about the reality of that situation and think about how do I use that rather than trying to avoid it. 100%. Absolutely. Absolutely. The easiest way that I think about tax is if you're paying lots of tax, it means you're making lots of profit. And that's a good thing, right? You obviously want to be tax intelligent. There's no point being tax stupid, right? And there's no point wasting money. But it's important not to stymie and stifle your financial opportunity in the pursuit of trying to save tax. It just doesn't make any sense because you're actually going to, and we're going to prove that in this episode. So why don't we start? Because a lot of people don't really understand what capital gains tax is. They don't really get it. They've just kind of heard that it's a big, scary, dark thing that happens and, you know, and and people aren't really sure about it. So why don't we start with that? I mean, what what is capital gains tax? Yes, a capital gains tax is essentially the tax that you pay on a capital gain, right? Very simply. And so what that means, if we put it in a like a real estate context, what that means is when you go to sell an asset, so you go to sell a property, Mm. uh, it is you make a gain, generally speaking, if the property has gone up in value from when you purchased it, you are making a gain on that asset. So let's if we take an example of if you bought a property for four hundred thousand. If in five years' time you sell that for six hundred thousand, you've made very simply a two hundred thousand dollar gain. And so CGT comes into that, where your marginal tax rate as an individual, you would pay that amount of tax on that two hundred thousand dollar gain, and that would be your capital gains tax in that situation. So it's essentially, in, if you take it in a business context, if a business makes a profit in a year, they then pay a tax amount on that profit. And so that's kind of how it applies in this sense. But it's basically if you make a profit or you make a gain on your capital, you need to pay a tax on that. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and and it's and it's the same. The same thing applies. It's not just real estate, right? It's any asset that you buy and then sell for profit. So the same thing applies to shares. And this is actually one of the things that's really frustrated me over the years is that in the whole kind of like shares versus real estate discussion, obviously there's the real estate's illiquid and shares are liquid. There's that discussion. But then there's the, oh, the selling costs. Oh, it's not real money because it's just locked up in equity. And oh, it costs you so much to get access to it. When in actuality, that's just bullshit. I mean, you pay capital gains on shares as well, right? So this is not something that is exclusive to real estate. 
And I think this is just this, it's this completely ridiculous concept out there that real estate is suddenly encumbered with all of these additional unforeseen costs and it's so hard to get access to your capital when in, when, when in reality it's not. It is less liquid, right? And so it could take you, you know, maybe 90 days or whatever if you did want to liquidate your portfolio or liquidate an asset to go and realize that, to, to, to turn that liquid. Fine, got it. But in actuality, you're going to pay capital gains tax on shares. You're going to pay capital gains if you make if you make a profit, right? You also get capital losses. So you can actually get tax credits. So if you lose money, you can also get tax credits based on that, right? So you're going to get capital loss. So this idea that you're going to pay tax on profits anyway. So just as you pointed out, like if a company makes money and makes a profit, guess what? You pay tax, right? Same thing goes, right? To make it very simple. It's not some foreign concept. The only difference with real estate is that you're also probably going to pay a real estate agent to sell the property as well and you have some conveyancing costs too. But in the grand scheme of things, they're pretty nominal costs and we'll kind of talk to that in a moment as well. But what I think is important to um, to probably dig into is where and when this applies. Because you said, you said just to be clear, you said CGT earlier and that's kind of the, the shortened version of capital gains tax. A lot of people will refer to it as, as CGT. So when is it not applicable? Because there's a few quirks about it. It's not just as simple as paying your marginal tax rate on any gain that you make. So there's times that it doesn't apply and then there's discount rates and maybe we can dig into some of that kind of stuff. And then uh, and then maybe we can start to actually run through some numbers that kind of explain how it, how it actually plays out in, in real terms. What do you think? Mm-hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, cool. So an example of a time that capital gains tax probably wouldn't apply is a primary residence, right? So if you own your family home and then you sell that family home, you typically, typically don't pay capital gains tax on it, right? Yeah. And it's important to note, like the government changed these rules all the time, right? So there's different, there's different eligibility at different point in time. You get different discounts at different points in time. So if you are looking into like wanting to sell your property over the next couple of years, this is something to kind of stay in touch with and start researching about and, and get a feel for what actually are the rules applying now and if there's any that are going to change in the next 12 to 18 months that might be relevant for you. But yeah, at the moment, basically, if you sell your principal place of residence and you can prove that it's your principal place of residence, so like you live in it the majority of the time, your personal belongings are in there, it's the address where your mail gets to, your utilities are connected to. If you can prove that it's your principal place of residence, then any gain that you make on selling that asset, you actually are exempt from paying tax on, in principle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In yeah, principle. Yeah. And so conversely, if the, the flip side of that is that if it's an investment property and you don't live there the majority of the time, you are generating revenue from it, and then you sell that asset, you are liable, generally speaking, for capital gains on that profit that you make if you sell it at a, at a profit. Yeah, totally. And it's interesting as well, because then a lot of people, they hear about a 50% capital gains tax discount. And I actually think that this is where some of the misunderstanding about the tax comes into place. Because I think people hear 50%, right? And they go, I've got to pay 50% CGT. They think about the other 50%, yeah. I think the mental model is, if I buy a property for $400,000 and sell it for $600,000, I'll make $200,000 and then I'll pay 50% in capital gains tax. I think that that is generally how I, from the conversations that I've had, that seems to be the way people think about it. When in actuality, what we're talking about is a discount rate, right? So when the discount typically applies is if you have held the asset for longer than 12 months. Mm-hmm. So... If you buy a property and then sell it within 12 months, you're probably not going to get a capital gains tax discount, which means if you bought a property for $400,000 and then sold it for $600,000, you would you would be liable to have tax applied to the entire amount of profit, the $200,000. And that amount would be taxed at the marginal tax rate. Now, Interestingly, and this is probably a little bit further into the topic than than I've got the expertise to go into, but as I understand, when you then apply, let's say you added that $200,000 to your household income for the year, because it's income, right? That would push up your marginal tax rate. So you might be on 37% as a marginal tax rate, but then you add, say, $200,000 to your to your household income because you've sold the property, then that would likely push you into a, a higher tax bracket, probably 45% marginal tax rate. 
So that's something to consider as well. But for the purposes of this discussion, let's kind of get back to the back to the root of it. So if you sell it in the first 12 months, your marginal tax rate will be applied to the whole amount. But again, that's not 50%, right? So it could be 37% or 45% or this is, and obviously you've got to speak to your accountant about that to work that out, but it's still not, not the whole lot. Now, this applies to people who are flipping, right? Which is actually one of the downsides yeah. of flipping, right? So there's obviously a lot, I think there's a lot of downsides with flipping, including risk and all of these other kind of things. But if you buy a property, do a massive renovation on it, i.e. create a bunch of gain and then sell it within 12 months, you're going to pay tax on the entire amount, the entire profit amount, which again, just to go back to the point, is not necessarily a bad thing, right? You're making, you're making profits, right? You just got to factor that into your calculations. Yeah. And I think like to give some context, like that is why the flipping strategy is basically why that 50% discount has been put in place for after 12 months. Because what was happening was people were buying assets, flipping them for a huge amounts of profit. And basically they, they would pay some tax. I don't remember what the, t- the tax amount was, but there would basically the government felt that they were rotting the system in terms of like being able to buy an asset, flip it and turn it into profits very quickly and then get out. So at the moment now they've put in where if you hold it for more than 12 months, you actually get a benefit to stop people from flipping houses yeah. so quickly. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. So what then happens after 12 months, if you've owned the property for more than 12 months, is typically there's a 50% capital gains tax discount that gets applied, which means in the scenario that we've been using as an example, you buy a property for $400,000, you sell it for $600,000. That means that only 50% of the $200,000 gain would be liable to be taxed, right? Which is obviously massive. So that means that you're only going to get taxed on 50%. So you only get taxed on 100 grand. And again, if your marginal tax rate is 37% or 45%, that's the, then that's the percentage that you'll pay tax on, which is really interesting because people still get caught up in this like, oh, but it's still 30 cent. Let's call it 45% for the sake of the discussion because because it might push up your household income. So let's just use that as the as the measure, 45%. If you in that scenario, if you have a $200,000 gain and then you pay tax only on $100,000 of it and then you pay 45% tax on that, you're going to pay $45,000, which is what about 25% tax, which is basically a company tax rate. Yeah. Right. So so company companies pay tax on their profits at a rate of about 26, 27%. Right. And so if you're paying forty five thousand dollars out of two hundred, that's a twenty two percent, twenty two point five percent tax rate, which is in essence, and this is the easiest way to think about it, in essence, it's exactly the same as paying company tax, like company tax. Right. And if this is for investment purposes, you've essentially got a real estate business. So we're going back to this whole concept of like operate your portfolio like a business, right? In which case, just like any business that makes profit, you're going to pay tax on it. And in this case, you know, using that example, 45 on 200 is only going to be 22.5% tax, right? Which is actually really low. Yeah. When you compare it to particularly like your individual tax bracket, it's significantly lower. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that this is the big misnomer out there because everyone gets everyone gets all wound up and says, oh, I don't want to pay tax and, oh, I'm going to lose all my money. When in actuality, when you actually break it down, you'll be paying less tax on that gain than you'll be paying tax on your household income. You'll be paying less on that, on that capital, on that gain than a company would pay in, in company tax as well. And so... Yeah, I think I think that's kind of like a, a big piece. What are your what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it'd be awesome if we can go through like a case study example walking through mm-hmm. the numbers and how they apply. Because I think we get we get the picture that if you sell a property in Australia in the current environment and you've held it for to sell a property, you need to pay you need to pay tax, right? If you hold it for more than a year, you need to get a fifty percent discount on your capital gain, so then you pay slightly less tax. And so we've we've got the picture that you need to pay tax. So there's a cost there, right? But I think where people get scared about this concept is that they're not really weighing up the pros and cons of the strategy that they're doing. So particularly in real estate, like it's when you compare it with something like shares, like there's ups and downs in any particular strategy. So if we apply it to real estate, yes, there's a cost in terms of tax, but you compare it with the upside of doing a particular strategy, buying a particular asset, selling it at a particular time, in a lot of cases outweigh the cost of that CGT 
when you do go to sell it. So I think it'd be awesome if we can go through an example of what those numbers could look like. Like if you sold a, a, a particular property after like five years, yep. how does the cumulative upside of holding that asset for five years compared to the cost of selling? It sounds That sounds great. Okay. So let's set the premise with this then. So let's say it's a $500,000 property that you buy. And let's say that the holding period is five years. Yep. And let's say that the average growth rate over those five years was 7%, right? Which I think if you've bought at the right time in a market is is a totally reasonable five year growth rate, right? Yep. Okay. And then let's also let's also add to that. Let's put another couple of premises in there. Let's assume that it's a six percent gross rental yield, and let's assume that it's on an eighty percent principal and interest loan at three percent interest rate. Okay. So these are our parameters. So five hundred thousand dollar per purchase price, seven percent per year growth rate for five years. Selling at at the five year mark with a six percent gross yield on an eighty percent principal and interest loan on a three percent interest rate. Cool. Got it. Got it. Awesome. Okay. So on that basis, let's walk through some numbers so that this starts to make sense. Okay. So if you bought a five hundred thousand dollar property, your total cash contribution to buy the property is going to be somewhere around one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars. That is factoring in stamp duty. That is factoring in, um, if you're working with a company like Dashshot, that'll be factoring in those fees. It is factoring in building and pest inspections, conveyancing, all of those kind of costs, right? The round figures, you're going to be looking at about $135,000 from go to work. Okay. Now, that property that you bought for $500,000 in year one, let's also just assume that you bought that at fair market value. So let's assume you didn't buy it under market value or anything like that. Okay. Just to keep the math simple. In year five, that property will be worth $701,276. Okay. So bought it for $500,000. It grew at 7% a year uh, compounding. It's now going to be worth $701,276. Cool. Cool. Great. So on that basis, the difference between the purchase price and the Sale, we'll assume that that is the sale price for the point of this discussion. The difference between the purchase price and the selling price is $201,276. Okay, so you bought it for $500, you sold it for $701,276, and then you've got a capital gain of $201,276. Make sense? Yep. Great. Now, on that basis, right? And let's also assume that you've held this property for more than a year and you're eligible for the 50% capital gains tax discount, discount okay? Mm-hmm. What that is actually going to equate to is on the $201,276 of capital gain that you have made, you will be liable to pay $45,287. Now, that number is based on a 50% discount, so you're only paying tax on, on you know, $100,500 or whatever times by a 45% marginal tax rate. So that is allowing for the fact that you might be pushed up into the the top tax bracket, okay? So then if you've got a 45% tax on uh, 50% of $201,000, that results in a capital gains tax bill of $45,287, okay? Yep. Simple. Now, for reference, as we pointed out earlier, that would be 22.5% of the total gain. So you've made $201,000 and you're paying 22.5% tax on it which is again, lower than your income tax and again, lower than company tax, right? It's actually extremely tax efficient. (laughs) It's like, it's a very low tax rate. Now, let's keep going because this is where it gets really interesting. So again, this is on the premise that we're selling at five years and we'll talk about why that might be a good thing in your portfolio in a minute, but let's go through the numbers. Yeah, so just with that CGT amount, so we're at $45,000 in the CGT we're accepting that we need to pay that because it's just that is a cost of this strategy as a tax cost. Yeah. Yeah. It's the cost, cost of doing business. It's the cost of doing any business, right? Yeah. Okay. So on that basis, right, you're also going, if you sold the property, you're going to also pay more than just tax. You're also going to pay about 3% in selling costs. Okay. So you're probably going to get a real estate agent, marketing costs, all of that kind of stuff. You're probably going to pay around about 3% in selling costs. If you sold the property for $701,276, you will pay selling costs of 3%, which would be equal to $21,038, okay? Roughly, yes. <laughs> roughly, roughly, like roughly. 21 grand. Okay, so you pay 21 grand, 21 grand in selling costs. 
So now your accumulated total costs, uh, capital gains, tax, and selling costs, which are $66,325. Okay. Yep. So nobody really wants to have a bill for $66,325, but let's put that in some context because context is everything. So let's go back to the premise, right? So the premise is you bought a $500,000 property at a 6% yield. Now, you're also going to get over that five-year period of time, you're also going to get cash flow from the property. So the net cash flow after tax is actually going to be about $5,000. So all of a sudden, you can then add that into your into your total returns for the property over the five-year period as well. So you bought a 500... Just to review how we got to that cash flow number. So we've got a 6% yield and the... Loan structure we're using for this example is 8% principal and interest, 3% interest rate. Yeah. So net cash flow factoring in of a 45% marginal tax rate leaves you with roughly five four thousand seven hundred dollars net cash flow after five years. Yeah, totally. And that's also factoring in eight and a half percent property management, insurance costs, council rates and water and maintenance, right? So that would be yeah, net net. That would be fully net actual in the bank cash flow after tax over a five-year period. Cool? Yep. Got it. And that is also factoring in principal repayments too, right? So that's your free cash flow after the principal repayments. So then what what you've ended up with is you've sold the property and because you've been paying down your principal along the way, which is why your cash flow is a little bit lower, you will have bought the property for $500,000. You will have sold the property for seven hundred and one thousand. The total amount of equity in the property, because you because it's grown and you've also been paying down debt at year five, would be three hundred and forty five thousand six hundred and fifty. Okay, so then you got the selling cost of twenty one thousand and thirty eight dollars, and you've got your five year accumulated cash flow of four thousand seven hundred and thirty four dollars, which means that total amount of equity that you got three hundred and forty five thousand minus CGT minus selling costs. Plus cash flow equals a total net result of two hundred eighty four thousand and fifty nine dollars. Right? Not chump change. Not chump change, right? <laughs> and so when you then look at the upside, right? So then, so then, what that, that basically equates to an internal rate of return of forty two percent a year, which is just wild, right? When you're talking about returns in the share market of like seven, six or seven percent a year, mm-hmm. it makes a huge difference. Now, Gabby, one thing I've just thought about with those numbers is did we deduct the initial capital from the total return? Ooh. Ooh. Because that's going to give us a that's going to give us a real return rate. Okay, Gabby. So what we actually just worked out there is we hadn't factored in the initial capital. So once you take out the initial capital of $135,000, you're going to end up with a net return of $148,994. Right? Yeah. Because the total end amount that you're going to end, end up putting back in your bank account is going to be around about two hundred eighty-four thousand dollars, but of that is capital that you've already put into the in in the first place. Now, so what that equates to on a total basis is selling costs in capital gains tax of sixty-six thousand, which includes sorry capital gains tax plus the, plus the actual like getting a real estate agent and all that kind of stuff, which means that the total selling costs. Are going to be equal to 30, 30%, 30.8%. Yep, makes sense. Which again is still lower than most people's marginal tax rate. And so then if you said, okay, well, I'm going to make $148,000 in net profit and I'm going to spend $135,000 in the initial, that means that you're going to create about 110% return on your capital over five years. Yeah, not bad. That is not bad. So, Times that by 10, sorry, times that by, and then, so what that's going to work out to be is about an internal rate of return of 21.9% over five years, which is still very good. So the point that we're trying to make by walking through these numbers is that you're not going to lose all your money and you're going to end up with a really great return regardless. And at some point, you're going to need to think about how are you going to access that capital? Now, you may be able to access the capital in the properties that you've got by getting additional debt and refinancing capital out, but you may not. You know, a lot of people reach their serviceability limits and they reach their financial caps and they can't continue to borrow, in which case you're only faced with a couple of options. Now, for a lot of people, the idea of selling property becomes so scary, they think they're going to lose and all of this kind of stuff that they do nothing, which in fact exposes them to a huge amount of opportunity cost. 
Now, when in reality, sometimes it can be a really powerful strategic maneuver to keep you moving forward. And so I can use a couple of examples to illustrate this point. So uh, one of our clients uh, was actually in that position. Now, before they came to work with us, they had already previously bought a couple of properties. And so by the time they came to us, they were really close to their serviceability limits. They also didn't have a lot of available capital left. However, they did have a couple of other properties and you know they had equity in the family home and all of this other kind of stuff. So we helped them buy a property, which is a great property and is performing really, really well. But then they were stuck going, okay, well, what do we do now? Because their serviceability was so low that they could only get a couple of hundred thousand dollars of debt. And so we had to go, okay, well, how are we going to transform this situation? And the way to transform the situation was actually to sell one of the other properties and then reinvest that capital in a higher cash flow asset and to realize that gain. And another, another client of ours, now, again, they've got a lower available amount of debt. And so they're, realistically, it's going to be very hard for them to achieve their, you know, their financial cash flow goals based on the amount of capital they've got and the amount of debt that they've got. However, using an aggressive growth-based strategy, we could help them to accelerate their capital and then factor in the selling costs to release that capital to then reposition that into higher cash flow assets later on. And so back to what I was kind of saying at the start is that you've also got to think about the mechanics of market cycles. Market cycles aren't, it's not a straight line. You know, it doesn't just go from, you know, one corner of a graph, the bottom left-hand corner to the upper right-hand corner. Markets move kind of like a staircase. So they go up and then they go sideways and then they go up and then they go sideways, right? And so when you understand that, you then can start to think about what's the best way to reposition and repurpose your capital. And For some people, and I'm not suggesting this is for everyone, and I'm also not suggesting that this should be for all of your assets. However, there may be really good opportunities for you to strategically sell down some assets in your portfolio to reposition that capital to get a higher total return on your money over time. And I think this is what what investing is all about at, at its core. It's about moving capital and resources into different assets to produce different results at different points in time, depending on what outcome you want. So like in this example, we've got a net result of, say, 150 grand, going back to the the case study we just walked through, Mm. 150 grand that you can then put into one other asset or two other assets, or you can put it in in any other vehicle that's going to produce some kind of different result than this property that it's been in for five years. And I think so it's a really important conversation, I think, particularly for, you know, there's a lot of people who have owned their homes for quite a while. They've owned their properties for, you know, 10, 5, 10, 15 years, maybe the family home. And so they're getting to a point now where they're not getting the lifestyle that they want from their current income, from their current jobs, but they've got this equity space in their home and they need to think about how do I deploy that. So I actually, I speak with my mum, for example, about this quite a lot because she owns two properties that have quite a lot of equity in them. But her income is actually she's actually tapped out in terms of borrowing to be able to actually liquidate at any of that capital. So we're having a conversation at the moment talking about should she actually consider selling either our family home, which I grew up in, or another property that she has as well, and thinking about how to liquidate the funds that are in that asset. And so one of her big concerns is capital gains tax. And so we keep kind of having this roundabout conversation, thinking about like trying to educate her on capital gain tax and like that exactly what we're talking through about in this episode about how yes it is going to happen because you're making a gain so you will have to pay tax on it but educating her on how we can if if we went down that path of selling the asset what the upside would be and how you could deploy those funds of selling the asset into another asset for example where you can increase your cash flow so that's kind of what we're talking about with her at the moment and it's I just I just thought of that then because it's exactly what we're talking about in this episode because you get the result of selling this asset. Yes, you pay tax, but you still end up with a net gain from you know five years or whatever that you've actually been holding that asset that you can then deploy into something else that's going to help you get closer to your goals. Hundred percent. I mean, in this example that we've just used, what we the premise is that we said that we bought a property using one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars cash, and then in five years you're going to end up with one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in profit. So you've over doubled your cash in five years, which is pretty, which is pretty good. And that is that's factoring in all of the entry. Well, that's factoring in all of the entry and exit costs, right? So that's factoring in all of the cash that's required to get into the deal and all the cash that's required to get out of it. 
And so I think that for a lot of people, thinking about that strategically is, is really important. And obviously, as you apply a longer time horizon to it, obviously the equations start to change. And again, if you then were to change the loan structure, it's going to then create another, uh, another differential equation. So for example, in the case that we've just used, which is an 80% principal and interest loan, you're looking at 110.3% total return over five years. And again, just broadly speaking, <laughs> if you used 90% leverage, you could end up with 156% gain over five-year period. And so there's different levers that you can pull that are going to maximize your opportunity depending on what your strategy is, right? So if your strategy, for example, is how do I get the maximum possible returns over five years? Because then I'm gonna then I'm gonna sell down aspects of my portfolio, recapitalize and go again. Awesome. You should be thinking about potentially how you could use a little more leverage in that in that example. If you're someone who already has plenty of capital and you're playing a longer game and you're like, look, I actually want to maintain more cash flow and assets and all of these other kind of things as well, and maybe you've got a 20 or 30, 40 year time horizon, then perhaps you would want to approach that differently again. But I think it's I think it's really important that for people to learn to get out of their own way and to not be scared of tax and to actually think about as you as you were just pointing out with your mom to go okay how do I reposition this capital to get me more of what I want and what gets you out of Egypt won't get you to the promised land so it's very likely that for most people the initial phase of the portfolio is going to be about how do you accumulate capital and then the second phase which we call the acceleration phase is how do you increase cash flow right and they're two very distinctly different strategies right and for example what your mum has done and achieved with the properties that she's got she's accumulated a lot of capital win perfect and now it's time to reposition that capital into higher cash flow assets so that she can look at income replacement right and and understanding the benefit of that because there's more than just financial benefit there's also lifestyle benefits and then it's like okay well how much would you pay to have the life that you want so let's say you've accumulated five hundred thousand dollars of profit in an asset and then you're gonna have to pay you know total selling costs and tax of say 30 percent on that but you can then transition that capital into another asset which is going to pay you a living income so you don't ever have to work again well then all of a sudden if you paid 30 percent on five hundred thousand dollars would that be a cost that you would be prepared to pay in order to not have to work again versus keeping your money locked up in an asset and staying in your job for another 10 years? You know, And these are the real, real, real considerations that people need to think about before they just make arbitrary decisions about saying, well, oh, geez, I really don't want to pay tax. Yeah, I just think like it's such an important thing that I wish more, particularly as people, like if you're approaching retirement, need to really think about because in that particular example, you have two properties that have a whole lot of equity in them, but you don't have an income. You have to keep working five days a week because you don't have the income to do anything else. And you may have properties that are renting out, but they're like you're renting out one, but the yield isn't good enough. So you just have to keep working. Whereas if you can think about if I sold that asset, I might, yes, I'll pay CGT on that. But if I sell it, I can put it in an asset that pays me cash flow. And then maybe I can use my working hours to three days a week instead of five days a week. And that's exactly what you're saying. Like that is totally possible to you if you can think about all of these strategies. And you can think about like, okay, I'm going to accept that I'm going to pay CGT, but I'm going to bear that cost because I'm going to put these funds into an asset that's going to give me back my time and give me back my life. Yeah. That's ultimately like what this whole <laughs> conversation is about. Yeah, totally. And then the question is like, how much would you pay to do that? You know, like if you're in a position where you owned two or three assets that had a lot of capital gains and no cash flow, let's say they were cash flow neutral, and you subsequently you still had to keep working every day just in order to give yourself a living wage, what would it be worth to never have to work again in your life? Do you know what I mean? Like, what would that actually be worth to you? And when you frame it up like that, I think most people would say, well, Jesus, what am I doing? Right. And, and really, but most people just don't think about it like that. So my hope is that this episode has dispelled a few myths around capital gains tax and is allowing people to understand that for the in the right place in the portfolio and in line with the strategy that's going to move you towards your goals, like it's totally acceptable to pay selling costs and pay capital gains tax. And in fact, capital gains tax is probably only going to be about 22.5%, which is going to be less than you're going to be paying on your on your income. And even once you factor in selling costs, you're probably only still going to be looking at around about 30%, which again is less than your marginal tax rate anyway. So stop being scared of this and start making better decisions so they're going to move you towards your goals faster. That's my message. So considering everything we've just said, I really want this episode to be shared around to anyone that you can think of that would actually get benefit from this because I think there's so many people, as we've touched on, that have this 
fear of tax in general, but particularly CGT. So if you know anyone that in your life, in your in your family, in your in your circle of friends that are kind of in that situation where they feel kind of trapped in their life situation in their jobs, but they may have an asset that they could maybe liquidate. But there's a bit of fear there about capital gains. Like, please share this episode because I really want this to be able to reach people that it's going to help. Because again, we like we don't share these episodes in this podcast because we just like talking about stuff. We share it because we actually want to impact and help where we can. So if you do know anyone that this will benefit, please share it with them. Not for my benefit, for their benefit. Totally. On that note, let's wrap it up. I hope you've enjoyed this, guys, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Speak soon. Thanks. Bye.